Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thanks for joining us on this beautiful Friday. My name is Marina Amini. I'm the executive director for CVC. And we are so excited to bring you our webinar today with our facilitator, Kelly Spoon. Uh, I'll just take a quick moment to introduce her and this webinar and then just hand it right off to her. Um, so you are in assessing learning in online classes with Kelly Spoon. This webinar will be about 90 minutes long. And um, Kelly, if you don't know her already, is a professor of math at San Diego Mesa College. And she's always ready for something new. Um, she has, uh, from teaching Mesa's first supported statistics and calculus courses to playing with different modalities, tools, and resources. Um, she's also really worked closely with standard-based grading and building thinking classroom approaches in a supported calculus class and um, just a bunch of other wonderful activities at her various sites that she's worked with, including promoting zero textbook costs and OER projects as well. So um, with that, I will hand it off to her with just a quick reminder that I will be managing chat. If there's something that you have a question for, for me, I'll, you know, I'll be looking for you in chat. And then also, um, if you could also take our survey, which I'll be dropping at about 40 minutes in, uh, I would really appreciate it. We want to improve our future webinar uh, offerings. So we look forward to your feedback and I'll be dropping that link at about halfway through. Um, we do not offer a badge for this particular class. So if you need verification that you've attended it or some kind of um, evidence, what you can do is take that survey and then click a button to send an email to yourself with a copy of that survey. And that can serve as your verification. If you need additional verification, you can send us an email at support at cvc.edu. Uh, and with that, I will hand it off to Kelly. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, there's a quick question, Cassie, yes. Um, will you just remind us that you've dropped the survey in the chat? Yes. Just like do a, a thing or something so um, I don't miss it. Thanks. You got it. Thanks, Cassie. All right. I'll, I'll of course call it out too. <laughs> I got you. Thank you. All right. All right, thank you so much for that lovely introduction. So yes, I, I teach math at San Diego Mesa College. Um, I'm also one of our online faculty mentors and part of our like teaching and learning team at uh, Mesa, which started as our online success team. So sort of the intersection of these two things. Um, when I interviewed with that one to do some of these spring webinars, they actually asked me, what, what would you wanna do a webinar on? Like if you could choose which would be your absolute favorite. Um, and I said, uh, online assessment. Um, this is something I have done a lot of my own professional learning about. Um, and it's something I've also just struggled with as an online instructor, right? How do I assess my students in, a, in, in this modality? Um, so these are just a couple of other presentations I've done. Usually I focus more on like overarching grading systems. Like how do we like rethink the entire thing um, in terms of alternate grading. Um, but you can see I've even reused some of the same slide templates to do similar talks. So uh, hopefully we're, we're gonna get a lot of different ideas from these different talks, but focusing more on just like that assessment in the online space. Um, and at any point you want to ask a question, just throw it in the chat. I've got that open. Uh, feel free to raise your hand too. I'm mute like Cassie did that. That is perfectly fine. I am someone who can roll with those punches. So uh, I wanted to give you a couple of my goals for the webinar. Um, one, I'm really hoping I didn't check any of my animations that they're all going to work out well. Um, but I'm also just hoping that we can reflect a little bit on like just grading and assessment as a whole and sort of whether or not we're doing this in the best way possible, maybe what some better ways we could do this are. Um, I'm hoping to provide some, yes, uh, some structure, some strategies for creating effective and equitable online assessments. Um, we actually had a really great at one webinar. I don't remember, like maybe, I think it was earlier this month or last month uh, with Suzanne Joaquim, who does an amazing job on authentic assessments. So that's another great place to go for that. Um, and then share some resources and techniques that we could use uh, in the online space. So to get started, I would love for us to just take a moment and write in the chat, what is the purpose of assessment? Like, what do you view the point of assessment to be? Uh, I'm gonna give you a minute because otherwise I will start talking in like 10 seconds. Um, so go ahead, type. You can wait till that minute's up to press enter if you want your sort of buried, or you can just, you know, press enter.
I love this. There's a lot of measurement, right? Measuring learning to find out how its students have learned, uh, to see if students are understanding material. A lot of that theme coming in. Um, there's also a bit of other pieces here, right? We have these ideas of like, uh, to a, to teach, sorry, this thing has a buzzer that I can actually hear, as a baseline, um, my teaching effectiveness, I love the idea of using it to go back and say like, did I do everything right, you know? Um, I feel like sometimes we just put, put the blame on else, elsewhere. Another, seeing if teaching is effective. Um, we got a lot, guide instructional decisions, gorgeous. Um, so I asked the same question to ChatGPT um, because I didn't know what you all would say and I wanted a slide to sort of summarize hopefully what came up in the chat, especially because uh, when you watch these old webinars back, there's no chat. You can't, you all of these beautiful things that have been said are just, they're gone. Um, so ChatGPT uh, 4.0 said that the purpose of assessment was sort of these six you know, of course, a numbered list with bolded text, because that's what she, chat GPT loves, uh, to measure student learning, right? That was sort of our, our biggest hit in the responses here, um, to guide instructional decisions. We saw a number of folks mention that, um, to provide feedback. Um, I didn't see too much there um, in terms of tell how, like, giving students that feedback. I did see, okay, Cassie, thank you, Cassie. Cassie put that in there to provide feedback to the student uh, for the person to assess his or her own, her own learning and seek avenues or areas to improve. Um, and to me, this is like the key to what I my job is in an online class in my mind is, I mean, the content's there. I could have found somebody else's videos. I could be curating, I could be making my own. Uh, but once the content's there, the real teaching is me giving that feedback, me helping that student figure out how they're going to go forward and learn this material or, you know, how they're going to use this material uh, to, to improve upon what they're doing. Um, but I do want to mention one of these bullet points um, because it like immediately like just hit me wrong, uh, which was motivate performance. I don't I think it's because the amount of time that I've spent in like the alt grading space and alternative grading is mostly just questioning traditional grading. It's it's just this big ar overarching umbrella to say like, yeah, I, I don't really know what to do. I don't have an answer, but I know that I don't love traditional grading. Um, but this brings me to like the big picture. Um, like if, if you're interested at all and sort of like, well, what do you mean grading is bad? Like there's, there's a lot of writing out there and a lot of folks doing excellent work in this space. Um, but I think the most interesting anecdote that I can give to folks on terms of like motivating performance, is that really what grades are doing? Um, was from an episode of Teaching in Higher Ed with Bonnie Stobiak, that uh, podcast, if you've never listened to it, uh, where Susan Bloom was on. And she gave this lovely example where she was like, imagine I had like a delicious peach. And I was like, hey, Tracy, I have this peach. Like, it's so good. Would, would you like to try this peach? Tracy's probably gonna be like, all right, sure. But if that question was finished with, would you like to try this peach? I'll, I'll pay you $5 if you try this peach. Now Tracy should be sitting there thinking, what is wrong with the peach? Why are you going to pay me $5 to eat this peach before I was in? But now I'm questioning why you have to have this like payment for eating the peach. And so that's the sort of same thing with grades, right? If we're saying, hey, this is going to be great for your learning. You need to do this. This is worthwhile for the experience of just doing it. As soon as we add points to it, we're essentially devaluing it, right? We're taking away that intrinsic motivation to want to learn for learning's sake. And we're just saying, hey, here's $5 for the peach. <laughs> Maybe not everyone likes peaches. Cassie. Um, will you provide for us uh, the day that and the link for this? I think I'll put it into the, the Yeah, slides. I think Susan Bloom is on. And um, yeah, oh no, Susan Yonkers. I love Susan Yonkers uh, name tag. Anyway, yes, thank you so much. Please. I will I'll put it in the in the resources. I haven't finished that last slide, but I'll put that in there for you. Um, but yeah, I mean, any of these names, if you see them in a teaching in higher ed podcast, it's worth a listen. Um, they're all amazing. 
Um, and so Jesse Sommel is also big in the ungrading world um, and goes even further to sort of question grades um, in that they can just sort of pit teachers and students against each other. Um, and that's like the opposite of what I want in an online class, right? I, I'm, I really want to be a coach, a guide on the side. Uh, how am I helping you get there? Um, I don't find this happening as much in my online classes, but I don't really publish grades or like let Canvas show the grade distributions, um, but they can make the classroom experience into a competitive one. Um, and they really just measure output, right? This is when students I feel like are more likely to head to something like ChatGPT and ask it to just do their discussion board because they're just interested in getting the points rather than what it is they're creating. Um, so that's that's me and my uh, soapbox. And now I'll get off and talk a little bit more about uh, assessments. So when we talk about assessment today, my goal is really to focus on those first three bullet points. Um, I guess they can evaluate the effectiveness of something I've done in my classroom. I'm a statistician by trade. And so I tend to look at things like evaluating effectiveness and just see a ton of confounding variables because no two classes are the same and no two semesters are the same. And I'm probably changing 20 different things at the same time. Um, so kind of got rid of the fifth bullet point there. Um, and then yes, a lot of us, especially if you're in CTE, do need assessments so we can prepare students for boards and things like that. But let's just focus on those first three pieces um, in terms of our purpose of assessment. I decided as I was um, like conceptualizing what I was gonna do in this webinar uh, to frame it within the three pillars of grading that Joe Feldman gives in Grading for Equity. Um, if you've read Grading for Equity or have any feelings about it, positive or negative, uh, I invite you to throw them into the chat. Uh, did you read this? And like my reading group of statisticians decide that he couldn't do math. Um, I don't know, there was like a whole period of like anti-math section that that my, my colleagues got very upset with when I did this as a reading group. Um, but I've had other folks who were just like really taken with it. Um, so, you have feelings about grading for equity. I'd love to hear them. Yes, yes, it is uh, a great book. Um, it is a great book because these three pillars, as we'll discuss and use to sort of frame the rest of the webinar, um, are things I think we can agree with. Um, and then he gives a lot of suggestions, many of which we may not agree with, of ways to, to meet these pillars. Um, so those three pillars are accuracy. Like, are we actually measuring what we're trying to measure? Like are, are our grades bias resistant? Like there's no subjectivity coming in and are they motivational? And I think motivational is that highest aspiration. I love Allison's question and we'll get to that um, a bit later. So I'm going to answer that in a bit. The other framework that I'm gonna be using throughout today to sort of uh, give us, a, I don't know, a nice resource to sort of think about these things is the CVC OEI online course design rubric. Um, so I'm just curious to know if you could put in the chat here just a zero, one, two, or three, where you are with this. Oh, I see a lot of threes. Ooh, some ones. A lot of us are poker stars. <laughs> oh, cool. We have a zero. I get to explain it to someone who's never even heard of this. There's no idea what this is. Yes. Cool. Perfection. All right. So if you are unfamiliar, <laughs> Brandon has to be a three. If you are unfamiliar with the CVC OEI online course design rubric, it's this amazing comprehensive document that tells you what you would look for for a like well-designed, right? An, an aligned course uh, that's online. So sort of we have all these beautiful evaluation things that we probably had to go evaluate our peers in our classrooms, in a physical classroom, what would we look for in an online space? And so I'm gonna show you um, what some of those things are in assessment because this, we're talking about online assessment and this lovely rubric has an entire section on assessment. Those of you who are threes, what's the section on assessment? It's a pop quiz. D3. <laughs> <laughs> it is section C. Yes, there are eight different 
uh, components to the rubric and assessment. Um, it kind of breaks assessment into two chunks. Uh, the first chunk is C1 through four. Uh, this is effective assessment, um, which is authenticity, validity, variety, and frequency. Um, We'll talk about how I do those in my course, how we can do those in online courses and why they're important. Um, and then the second, oh, and to me, these, by the way, go right along with the accuracy, especially, and the bias resistant, right? When you think about those three pillars from Feldman, the validity is basically accuracy. Are, do, do our assessments match up with our object, objectives, right? Are we measuring what we are setting out to measure with our assessments? Um, and then I think we do make sure we're bias resistant and accurate by using variety and frequency as some of those tools. So uh, variety means that we're not just doing multiple choice exams or we're not just doing discussion boards. We're giving students different ways to demonstrate their learning. Uh, and then frequency, um, as I said, for me, my online course, my students have to submit three things every week that I give them feedback on. Um, so that's a lot, <laughs> a lot of frequency. Um, but that's where I see myself actually interacting with the students, creating those relationships, helping them become better learners overall and just better, you know, citizens. Um, and then authenticity, of course, is like, how is this relevant, right? How is this authentic to what they're going to do um, in their real lives? So uh, the second section is about guidance and feedback. It's on the other side, um, rubrics and scoring guides, assessment instructions, feedback, and self-assessment. Um, so these also go along with bias resistant. Um, and then they also, in my opinion, this is where the kind of motivational piece comes in, right? You can get motivational too with the authenticity uh, in the previous section. Um, but I kind of see these aligning with those components of uh, the Feldman pillars. So before I jump in, I mean, I think Allison's already given us one in the Q&A a bit. Uh, I was hoping that we could take a moment to, I mean, you came to a webinar on a Friday afternoon, so you probably have some challenges when it comes to online, or you're hoping to get something out of this. So what are some of your challenges that you find in online courses? You can enter as many challenges as you want in the chat, so take a moment. And then Kelly, there's a couple of questions in the I question them, and answer yeah. section as well. So I don't know if you want to wait for those in a little bit or handle them sooner. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I think the first one I might get, or the second one I might get sooner. Okay. All right, a lot of a lot of cheating. Um, I was trying to add some, but you guys can add more as well. Y'all can add more. Um, yes. Oh, looks like someone might have used ChatGPT to get me some answers. <laughs> yes, thank you. God. Yeah, uh, you know how I knew. <laughs> you love a numbered list and a bulleted starch to that list. You just can't stop yourself, ChatGPT. Uh, all right. <laughs> So here's sort of my hope with this. Um, I'm going to see if I can't get this link in here. I've lost my slides. I have no idea what I did with them. Um, so let me throw it in the chat. I need to link, copy link to clipboard. There we go. Let's see if that works. Um, so I wanted to create like, just a quick little like, um, someplace for us to like capture ideas because like I said the one thing that I think is 
my saddest moment um looking at some of these old webinars uh when i like go back and rewatch them on at one's like lovely page is that all of the chat is just gone and if it wasn't said out loud or in a slide it is just like lost to the sands of time um so i'm hoping that we can use this padlet as a place to sort of save some ideas um so right now i have not done a fabulous job with it i tried but I was like multitasking um, to capture some of the things that I was seeing, right? Like the fact that we have, right, it's just rampant in the online classes, especially with grades. Students are just like, okay, if you're going to give me points, just let's get the points, right? Um, and then not using feedback, right? Especially when you spend a beautiful amount of time writing it, um, becoming tech support, that it can be overwhelming. Um, and I do like the getting reasonable results, like, I want more information, Tracy, by what you mean by re getting reasonable results. Like, what does that mean? Like, they're they're just not giving you anything that's what you expected. Um, I've never seen so many honor students in one physics class in my life since starting back in uh, I don't know 2020 or so with this whole pandemic business. I can uh, I get people acing exams and do, completing exams and times that I can't do them and basically in a hundred percent. And then I test those same students in the classroom with the same problems. And generally it's just flags all over the place. Yeah, so um, it's hard to get them to um, uh, actually take tests in a, a, what I would call a proper manner. All right, so I, that, that then goes back to the student authenticity and cheating. I think that that's like our, our main concern, right, is that like, I want the students work to be their work, I want them to take some pride in ownership, I want them to understand that the goal of the class is for them to learn and prepare for the next class or for life and not that the goal is just to get the A, because it'd be a lot easier for all of us if I just gave them all A's, and then we could just all go about our merry ways. Um, yes, I love some of these things. So what I would hope for right here um, like Matthew just provided an amazing response uh, for how to, how to get them to use feedback. So if you press the plus, you could be like, hey. Uh, and then you could, I'm just going to copy and paste that lovely idea and publish it. So then we can provide some ideas back for some of these things. So if you have some hacks that you're already using that are making sure that students are the ones taking their physics exam, feel free to just add that by pressing the plus button and then giving your idea. Um, Cassie. I, I, I might have made a mistake. I added yes. my own comment under oh, tech support. Look, I can fix and, it. And so I teach a writing, I teach writing classes pretty much. So I give those kinds of assignments along with quizzes. And um, what I'm finding uh, is that, uh, you know, in larger classes, a lot of them are really kind of dull because they're just like using uh, chat GPT to do a lot of facts, you know, without putting their experience and their perspective in there, which is the most interesting and the most memorable and really the most usable. So I try to teach them you use the fact, which is the bigger concept, you know, and then your experience. And it gets to be sort of, for me, demotivating because to consistently give them low grades and that same feedback on a rubric is like, oh God, not again. But, so. the, but wait, but that tells me, this is now that I'm just sharing that with you, it tells me that, you know, perhaps it's not interesting enough for them. Perhaps I need to change the assignment to some uh, point um, as opposed to, you know, just assuming that they're, you know, that uh, you're not doing it right, which I never do. I always take it back to myself. What do I need to improve? And that's, um, I think you discussed that at the very beginning of this webinar. I love your uh, Padlet. I think it's fantastic. You're Thank fantastic. You. Thank Kelly. you, Cassie. Well, I was going to say the same back to you because I do love that reflection of like, right, it, it, the first instinct is to be frustrated with the students. And it's like, well, maybe I'm doing something wrong, right? And maybe I'm not, you know, every once in a while you get a student who really just, it doesn't matter how much I jump through hoops. They're, they're not there to learn, right? That's not their goal. 
but I think everybody like inherently as humans, like we want to learn stuff. We're curious. And so the education system to some extent has like beat that curiosity out of us. Right. And it's made us just these point driven, like, let's go get those points. Um, but I think this goes back to Allison's first question. So I'm going to answer that right now, which is this idea of what do you do with students who submit assignments that don't follow the assignment directions? It takes a lot of work for you to accept revisions. Allison says that they allow students to revise, but if they didn't follow the instructions, assuming they're clear, I shouldn't have to regrade that work. So I do unlimited revisions on everything in my course. Um, and I have 46 students in a course where I maniacally have three different assignments every week or unit of material. So, and like, if I teach an eight week class, I'm, I'm grading six assignments per student, not including revisions. Um, I will admit that I am a bit of a monster who's willing to do that, um, but it's not that horrible because what I'm doing is I don't grade things on a, and we'll get to this, I don't grade things on a points-based system in that traditional way, right? So I'm not sitting there going, oh, this is a B level response. I'm just saying this isn't an A level response yet, right? And so if I'm in that situation that Cassie's in where these students are giving this sort of not very exciting answer, right? That's not really pulling from their experiences, not really getting into the things I was hoping to hear. I am sending it back to them with the feedback of, hey, I would love to hear more about your experiences. I'd like to hear more of your voice in this. And it's not coming across as punitive. And all of my students know, because I tell them at the beginning, expect that I'm going to push things back because I want to see that you can do better. Right. I want like even if you're at the top of your game, I think we could probably nudge this a little bit higher. Right. So it's it's about everybody showing that sort of improvement as well. Um, so I think that is part of it. Um, I feel like there was something else in the chat. Oh, and that also gets the idea of like, what do you do when students don't like, use your feedback? Right. They have to because they they don't have a B. Right. If I give them a B. Students can sit and be like, I got a B. I'm fine with that. Bs get degrees, right? And they don't, they don't need to resubmit. They don't need to take my feedback. They don't need to grow from that. Uh, but if I'm not giving them a B, now they need to go back and do that. Uh, and I, I do like Matthew's follow-up response idea too. Um, that's something I've considered working into a lot of my rubrics and have not yet is the idea that like everyone's going to have to follow up response something so that way I can see an additional layer of um, thinking. So I figured we've got a, uh, a room full of experts. Let's jump into exploring some accuracy. Are we measuring objectives of interest? And to me, this is really important because when we talk about um, that, like, like just in general design, backwards design is at the heart of everything. First thing we gotta do, what do I want students to get out of my online course? What is the goal, right? And then the next thing is, well, how am I gonna know if they've met that goal, right? That was our number one reason for assessment in general is to measure understanding, measure the learning that happened. Um, and then the last piece is, yeah, yeah, what content do I need? That's important too. But right now we're focused on number two, which means we need number one. So I'm gonna have us break down uh, this sample discussion board I just found on a random website. I just like Googled sample discussion board prompt. Um, and so Central Michigan University delivered. So I'm gonna give you a moment to read through this. All right, I don't know if that was enough time. It's a very beefy discussion board prompt. 
What do you think the learning goal is for this assignment? Put it in the chat. You can unmute if you want, if somebody wants to raise their hand. What was that objective? What was that first thing in the, I mean, we don't know fashion. We do wear clothes, so maybe we know something. To analyze a fashion collection, analyze balance in fashion. All right, read the textbook and apply those concepts to the real world around the student. Okay. Here's a follow up question. You're still typing, you can still go. Yeah, so show that you understand balance in fashion. Okay, and show that it looks like an actual fashion. What is being measured? right? Because there's this other piece, right? We're measuring something. What What are some of the things that are being measured? Is it just what you guys, what y'all typed into the chat? Or is this measuring more? What, like, just start throwing in things that, that are being measured in this particular assignment. Got knowledge of chapter five, use of terminology, pictures measuring their interest, Participation. Ability to understand tough directions. <laughs> Ability to analyze images, understanding, desire to do the assignment. There's a lot. I mean, like, these four bullet points are beefy. Like, I looked at this, and my initial thought process was like, okay, I got to complete a discussion board. Cool. That. Uh, and in that completion, I'm conducting an analysis. I'm going to demonstrate the achievement of visual balance. I'm going to explain in detail. I'm going to justify my choice. And like, there's also like in two robust paragraphs, what does robust mean? What must a paragraph do to be robust? Like, and the image or images have to have a minimum of three different looks, terminology, and then, okay. I, I got overwhelmed by how many things I was being asked to do in that discussion board. I think we did a really good job when I said, what's the learning goal, but it was never explicitly stated there. Yeah, Cassie. If you create a rubric though, for each one, so it would be good because the student has the um, written assignment in the assignment and then the rubric that goes with it is an extra piece for that learning and show, I mean, I know you don't like, so, uh, um, uh, you know, you could say, this was fantastic. You understand the concept well versus this was a great start. Uh, give it another try to show, you know, uh, the style of assessment you'd like to give and for them to go back to it um, in the rubric. And so they've got those two pieces and then they've got that rubric that they're going for to see that piece in the other thing, so. This would be a bitch to great. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah, <laughs> Alice, Allison has hit it like on the mark. This, like, I'm just like, oh no. Like I am, there's so many components. It's like, I don't even, I don't actually think this would be a bitch to grade though. I think as it is written, you're going to get a lot of subpar assignments submitted. You're going to get a lot of discussion posts that aren't truly meeting the mark because the mark is, I don't, I'm not 100% sure where the mark is. Um, so we're gonna talk about how we could have reworked this. As part of that, I do think we need to talk about what just objectives in general, even though, cause that's like the first step before we even get to assessment. Um, and some of the keys for like a good objective um, are that they are specific, they're measurable, they're relevant and they're attainable, right? And I do think that th this actually has all of that. Um, but yeah, like what is the writing? I love I love Susan's uh, note here about, does this even have a writing objective? If it's not, it's not measuring what it should. Like, this is why actually I meant to say when I showed that backwards design slide is as someone who's worked on our like teaching and learning team and who coaches faculty, the number of times I see rubrics that include things like eye contact or like grammar or things. And I'm like, that's, that's, that's all fine and dandy, um, but like you're teaching a course on XYZ and that's not part of your course outline. 
it's good to encourage students to do these things, right? We want to make them better overall, um, but maybe it shouldn't be part of your rubric um, because the other thing you're doing when you're asking students to like make sure they have robust paragraphs or like, you know, use proper grammar and punctuation is that they're more likely to now go to chat GPT or something like that to make sure that their grammar is good, if, if they're at all concerned about their writing. Right. And who's going to be most concerned about the writing, the students who didn't have the same opportunities, right, coming into our classrooms. So that to me is really important. Um, I do have to bring up objectives because, like I said, part one of backwards design. Um, also, there's an entire section on them in the CBC OEI course online design rubric, uh, which some of you had not seen before. So this is like the very beginning of this rubric is like, if you're teaching an online course, let students know what they're going to get out of it. Put it in every unit. Vomit your rubric, like your, your objectives in the course, like the overview for a module in each content page. Here's what you're going to learn in this content. Here's the objective. And then when they get to the assessment, so they can really see the structure, right? An online student needs to understand that there is a structure and everything has been provided for a reason, that you're not putting in extra things for like, that everything is really well thought out and curated for them for a purpose. Um, so objectives are a huge part. So I want us to think about these four things, specific, measurable, relevant, and attainable. And we tore this lady apart a little bit, this, this example apart a little bit, um, but let's think of maybe some positive things. Like where, do we see something specific do we see something measurable? Do we see something relevant? And by relevant, we mean to like students' lives and in real world. Um, and do we see things that are attainable to students? Like, feel free to pick one of those and, and go hunting for it and then throw it in the chat. All right, so I see season of this current year and pictures. Are we calling those things? Which, which one of these four pieces of an objective are we hitting with those? Because I'm seeing the like needing th an image of three different looks as being something measurable, right? three different looks. I can measure that. Like, did they do that? Yes or no. A student can know if they attained that. That seems like it's maybe both. I like the Diane's note here that those maybe go to the relevance, right? This is one thing that's really lovely about this assignment is that while this textbook may be a static thing, right, that talks about balance in terms of fashion and this composition of an outfit, all, this is like, go find a current, like this year thing. Right. And so students can go search for that and find it on their own. But this brings up another piece we didn't talk about in the measurement. Like, how is a student supposed to go find that? I mean, do they, right? Well, that was one of the concerns we had previously in our challenges as an online uh, assessment is like paying tech support, right? Sometimes if you don't hand students the exact thing they're supposed to look at, they get really overwhelmed by like, okay, well, how am I supposed to go get that? How do I find a regular collection? But maybe that's been something they've done already in this class. Um, I do think there's a lot of specificity in terms of like really making sure that this refers back to the reading and the lectures. I like John's note. This is also really useful in like the day and age of chat GPT, right? Is to be like, pull examples from the materials I've provided, um, which is a lot harder to do unless they're gonna feed everything into chat GPT, which they still can. Um, so. We're gonna deal with that. Um, oh, I love I love Sylvia's note here that this could be a more equitable piece maybe if it asked them to use images from their own culture or get, uh, invited them to, right? Because um, that might be a nice way to say, hey, if you could find a you know designer, I just think in general we could make it a little bit more relevant by just saying explain why you're why you liked this designer's work, right? Instead of making it just find three looks that show balance, find a designer's work that you're drawn to and explain why it does or does not meet these ideas of visual balance from our chapter using the terminology. Because then students are actually choosing something they really like and sort of critically looking at it uh, instead. 
So here's my take at sort of rewriting this beginning of this discussion board to be a little bit more objective friendly. Um, the purpose, just putting in a purpose, the purpose of the discussion is to demonstrate how visual balance is used to create balance, like outfits in fashion. And then the prompt, if you actually look back at this prompt, these four bullet points, they seem so separate. They're all just ways to conduct the analysis, right? Like it's all, these are like sub bullets of the first one. And the way it's written is just incredibly confusing and felt made it feel overwhelming. But I think if, if the prompt just said, conduct an analysis of a current year fashion collection by, and then told them what they needed to do, we would have cleared up a lot of that confusion. It wouldn't have felt so overwhelming of like, oh, I'm doing an analysis. Oh, I'm finding images. Oh, I'm just like, this is all one thing. You're showing me this by doing this other thing. Um, and this really comes back to the transparent assignment template. Um, if you are not familiar with it, uh, this is one of many versions. You just Google transparent assignment template. I'll also put it in the resources at the end. Um, and we use this in all of our cohorts that we do for our, our learning team on campus at Mesa. And that is you break your actual assignment or assessment down into what is the purpose. So we're linking it to the objective, making it relevant to students immediately, right? Um, we're giving them the task. The task itself is allowing students to see that this is attainable. It's not something completely overwhelming. We're breaking it down. You can do this, right? It's more specific. Um, and then here's the criteria for success. Like what, like, give me the nuts and bolts. What are the bullet points that I need to hit? And this could be a rubric, it could be just straight bullet points. Um, so everything in all my classes uses this transparent assignment template. I always explain to students why we're doing things. I tell them what they have to do, and then I tell them how I'm going to measure them on those things. Um, so you can imagine if we were if we're bringing in that last piece, the last component of the transparent assignment template for this discussion board, we might have these as our criteria for success, right? Did you include images? And did they did they did they meet the requirements? Were they from a current year? Did they have three different looks? Right. It, this is what matters to you, in terms of an objective. Right. Um, did they use terminology from the reading? Did they justify using these ideas? And then, if I care, I don't know why, but I could put you know write my two robust paragraphs. I'm just giving this person their robust paragraphs back in case they want it. But again, we're now we've taken this very convoluted discussion board post. We made it much more accessible um, for our students so that everybody's at a level playing field, right? And we're not, you know, the other advantage to this is I'm gonna have a heck of a lot less regrades and students who are confused about this assignment. Um, and it's amazing, you know, I, I, have, I have actually edited assignment instructions like in the middle of the assignment being as assigned, right? As soon as I see one student's come in, I'm like, oh crap, they did not understand what I wanted. I have just gone in and edited. <laughs> I have added things to the rubric because I'm like, oh no, I, I need to clean this up right away. And I'll apologize to the first student and be like, hey, I thank you so much for getting in there early. Um, turns out my assignment instructions were not the best. Um, but if they met the previous assignment instructions, I might give them credit and then have to worry about you know, everyone else. But um, I do think that uh, this is worth mentioning. If you really want to get into objectives work, I'm not part of this talk really, but um, this book by Macmillan, that's uh, Classroom Assessment, does a pretty good job of like going a little bit beyond Bloom's taxonomy. So Bloom's taxonomy focuses mostly on this like cognitive process dimension of like, remember, understand, apply. But um, in this book, they break this down also into what part of knowledge this falls into. Is it factual? Is it conceptual? Is it procedural? Is it metacognitive? Um, and then it has these lovely little like grids of like, okay, if you're asking them to apply and it's procedural knowledge, what are the types of assessments you could use? Is this a project? Is it an essay? Like, and it gives you this sort of score matrix that like, hey, if you're doing this, this type of assessment is going to align really well. So you're looking for ideas beyond the traditional discussion board, beyond a traditional exam. Um, it's a really great 
yeah, and uh, Allison here is giving us some more measurable things in the actual like chat of like instead of robust paragraphs, uh, giving a word li like actual like here's the word limit, um, but that way a student knows what the goal is for robust or an example, right? An exemplar is always a great way to do that. If we're gonna talk blooms and online assessments, yeah, Cassie. I'm sorry. Um, no. I have uh, some students who say that they work really hard to make the, the word, you know, the word, whatever the word count must be. And um, and I really don't want that. I guess it depends upon the different cl uh, class. What I really want, because my people will write, a lot of them will write. What I really want is the content. So I, I let, you know, again, it could be the different class. I like the idea of um, using our textbook materials very specifically and using uh, your uh, daily experience, you know, that, that was shared because that will help me. And then I don't really care. I do have like a two paragraph limit um, because I want them to, um, to write a draft and then get their work really uh, refined to the best of their ability so they develop that skill to be very clear and very concise. Um, but I teach more of a writing. So I, I love this, that note, because I, I mean, Allison, I think, is just trying to help out this teacher who wanted robust. Uh, I don't love a word limit. I just I, I'm like the the less I have to read, the better I might give the guidance of like, hey, it usually takes about three sentences to really convince me or to justify this or to give an example of what that justification might look like. Um, something else Cassie said really just made me think, too. Another thing that is really important in this sort of the place we're in right now with ChatGPT and all that is drafting, like to have students do that drafting, right? Cassie mentioned this idea of having students who've done uh, like a larger amount of writing and then bringing it down to make it concise, like having students walk through that actual process in an assignment, hey, here's where I started, here's some of the edits I made and here's why, um, is a great way to kind of ensure authenticity. You could even invite them to try putting it into chat GPT and say, hey, give your original, right? If you want to try this AI thing out, if, that, if that's what you want, give it your original ideas and then ask it to consolidate or go the other direction, your choice, right? I tend to go the other way of like, hey, ChatGPT is super verbose. If you give it a prompt, it'll it's going to write you paragraphs upon paragraphs, more than you need with a bunch of fluffy language that is not my voice and not me. So how could you take the ideas of it or figure out which ideas of it you like, or if there is anything you like, and then make that into something short, concise, and in your voice, or go the other way. Start with yours and ask it to help you refine, right? And if you give them prompts, it actually, you can kind of lean in a bit um, because it lets students know that we can use this, but here's how I expect you to use it, right? Like if you start with your own ideas, Here's the feedback. Here's the prompt I would use. What did it say? How did you change your writing as a result? Um, so anyways, the, the, what I was going to say about Bloom's taxonomy in an online class is that there is a big shift that has to happen, I think, if you're moving to online. And that is when you're in an on in-person class, I can do a lot more factual just do you remember? Do you know what sign of pi over three is? I can ask that question to my students and I'm just, that's, that's an easy assessment question. And I can see if they know it, it's very measurable. And I can do that. I can't really do that on an online class because they can just type it into a calculator. They don't have to recall it. It's, it's going to require uh, a lot more. So um, yeah, we have a question in the chat about whether or not you can detect if someone's used, you really can't. You can have a lot of suspicions like I did with that lovely uh, response before in the chat because it does love its numbered lists and it does love its bold. Um, but the, the more our students have access to more things, like if a student has chat GPT 4.0, uh, their responses are gonna be stronger. They can use paraphrasers. If they're a little more sophisticated, they'll, they'll know how to work around most of the, the actual ways that you would normally detect it. Um, so I think it's mostly just really trying to do what, what 
we mentioned before, this like asking them to bring in ideas from class, right? From the recordings, from whatever, asking them to bring in stuff that's relevant to them. Um, and then just pushing back when things don't seem as at the level that you would expect, right? If they miss the mark, um, I think three submissions are really the key, but we'll talk about how to make those a little less painful too. Um, yeah, I wouldn't, I've gotten to the point now where I don't, but um, so I was going to say about this too, is in terms of online course design, I can't test those things as well, but I still think they're important and they're building blocks to getting to the rest of it. So I tend to move those towards the auto graded type quizzes in my class, making them low stakes. Students can take them as many times as they want so that there's no real incentive for a student to go try to look up something that I consider factual, like that they should just know quickly um, on the internet. I just, I'm like, and I'll, I'll tell them like, hey, I really recommend that you go through this on your own. Just see if you know these things. And if not, go look them up, come back, get the answers. But I, this is more for you than it is for me, right? Like this is for you to build your knowledge. Unfortunately, I can't assess these things meaningfully online. Doesn't mean they're not important to be like available to you. Um, so I've just sort of transitioned a lot of that to like auto graded stuff um, or H5P where students can kind of get that immediate feedback. Um, which means that I have to also talk like I used to do uh, exams in my class. This is from an old uh, stats class that I ran. Um, and so I tried to be as like equitable as I could with online exams. Like I didn't use proctoring software. Um, I gave students three hours to complete the exam when I really designed it to be like an hour long exam. So they had enough time to sort of go look things up or not, but not everything. Like it did have to have some amount of understanding to do well. Um, it was I, I made it with open note, open whatever, because I really just wanted students to not feel pressured. And I didn't want the students who were willing to go use their notes to be in an advantage. Um, but I ended up with a pretty similar experience to I can't I think it was Tracy earlier um, where I, I had so many students just. I think I had a tutor who was taking the test for them because they would jump to the exact right questions. Like they would jump from question one to four to eight to 15 and fill those ones in and then go back and do the ones that weren't because those are the ones that I had that were static and the other ones came out of banks. And this like whoever was taking this test for everybody like knew. And it was just like it got overwhelming to the point where I was like, I can't I like I'm doing so many academic sanction papers and I just this is not what I want to be doing with my time like. I want, I want these students to be doing this um, like for themselves. And so I really had to think about like, well, my issue here with the exam is I was measuring more than just the exam questions. I was measuring test taking ability. I was measuring whether they had three hours to sit down to take an exam, right? I was, I was, I was measuring a whole lot more things. Like they had a quiet place to take this sort of exam without interruption. Um, and that kind of brings me to this idea of ensuring accuracy by removing what um, Suzanne McKeem called uh, confounding variables. So like what other things would stand in the way of a student, student demonstrating their understanding? So when we saw this one earlier, I was like, what if a student didn't know where to go look for the fashion images, right? What if they didn't understand the word robust? I'm also, I don't, this respond to two posts, I'm, I'm always mad about that. Don't, don't get me started on respond to two classmates because it's as ambiguous as the unnecessary word count to me. Um, if we're going to say respond to classmates, like at least give some structure about what that response is supposed to look like, right? Um, so let's, let's, let's think about when we see those confounding variables, like what are some other things that might stand in the way of a student being able to demonstrate their understanding and how can we remove those things? Yeah, Cassie. I asked them to respond to a certain number of peers. And if the they get overwhelmed in the course and they stop doing it, I respond, I provide one of those responses as um, extra credit. Um, uh, because at the very end in the survey, I asked students to fill out, they always learn from their peers, number one. And so some of them won't read it unless I it's in their grade, that's one. Number two, teaching business, I teach them that they have to address their peer by first name when they start, do one, one white space down, 
write something, you know, three sentences or so about what you liked or what you agree with or questions you might have or your perspective. So something personal and then provide a, then another space and then provide a salutary close of like, you know, thank you so much or whatever and their name. And so it's really um, as, you know, to get them, it, it's multi-purpose to, to do that. So that's one right. of your objectives then, right, is to is to teach them how to respond to each other in this professional way. And you're providing them some context, right? You're telling them here are some, this just says respond to two posts. That's when you're going to get the, I like what you said. I agree. Those are pretty. I don't like I Thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, thumbs up. <laughs> It's, what's worse, add a add a word count requirement to that, and then we'll get it really great. Um, I do think if if you want to think beyond the two posts reply, um, the small teaching online with Flower Darby and um, James Lang is great because they basically point out the whole point of a discussion board is to try to mimic an, like an in-person discussion, and an in-person discussion does not have me throw my ideas out into the void and then wait for someone to respond like a couple days later, it's more organic. Um, and so we've done a lot of discussion boards in our cohorts um, for our little teaching and learning where we don't make everybody do the initial post. As long as you're meeting the objectives by responding, right? Like you could add to someone else's idea or, you know, it's almost like a perusal, right? Where you can, in perusal, you can, you can like keep talking to somebody as opposed to just putting that first idea out there. Sorry, um, Cassie, and then yeah, curious. I just I would like you to uh, what what was the class that you recommended? Maybe put it at the end of the yes, yeah, small teaching online. It's a it's a great book that's sort of like all these great ideas about Vent. yeah. Uh, so yeah, I'll put that in there. Small teaching is is great, um, but they they also say like if you're going to do this, get, give some context, which is what you're doing in your class, Cassie. And yes, of course, they can always do a Google Google search to find definitions of words, which is I think completely okay. Right. Um, I don't like I don't mind where students get their knowledge from. And I think in, in no point in their real life are they not going to have like Google right next to them. So why would I make these like to me, that's inauthentic to make an assessment where a student can't use Google. Um, but like I said, it becomes really challenging for a lot of us, especially in the math and sciences. We have so long graded procedural or like like memory based things that it becomes really challenging to like go beyond that and be like, well, how the heck do I not just ask students what sign of pi over three is? Like, what am I gonna do to show that students understand these trig function values? Like if not do a sort of test without resources. Um, and then the question is, well, do they need to know them? <laughs> maybe that's, maybe we need to update some of our curriculum. Um, I will say that one thing we should do to ensure accuracy is work away from those confounding variables that are because we have not scaffolded appropriately. So like thinking about that fashion assignment, what are some of the things, right, coming back to this, what's something that this instructor hopefully did earlier in the course to help students with this idea? What are some of the scaffolding, some of the other like precursors to sort of assignments that you might've seen? All right, we had a reading assignment, which you probably hopefully gave them some, maybe here's the terminology you wanna know. Thinking back to that CVC rubric, that's actually one of the things is not to just give content, but to say, hey, as you go through the content, here's some terminology to pay attention to, right? Like here, here are some of the words that you might wanna do. Yeah, how, where to find collections of, of these images of fashion, like, right? So maybe this was a previous assignment Maybe that was in their intro discussion board. Find a current fashion um, thing that you think is interesting. Here's the places to go to go look for it, right? Also, like, just in putting an image in a discussion board, we know that's challenging for students. That's in my intro discussion board because I want to just tackle that right away in week one, make sure we're all good and we can do that moving forward and that we're always going to be able to input images. Um, so that's just some of the ways that we could rem remove some of the confounding variables of this assignment, right? If the technology gets in the way, if the knowing where to search gets in the way, those could have been 
prior assignments when they were super low stakes back in an orientation module, right? Hey, we're going to talk about fashion this year. Go find a picture that you like on the internet. Great. Um, another thing that we can do uh, besides scaffolding by giving students these smaller things that like lead them towards this bigger idea um, is we can give students options on how they demonstrate their understanding, right? If a student is not great at writing, that assignment seems daunting. Those robust paragraphs, I'm still I'm still triggered by that whole, I don't know what that means. Um, so what are other ways that students could demonstrate that they understand visual balance in an outfit for fashion? What is something else we could have students do? Feel free to unmute or throw it in the chat. Definitely provide videos, right? Yes, I love Diane's suggestion. Just make an outfit of their own or their friends, right? Like, hey, go find people, photograph a balanced fashion, outfit, explain why it's balanced. Why does it need to be a fashion? Like, it's cool that it's a collection, but like, go make your own collection, right? Heck, they could even sketch it if they're really artistically inclined, right? Or you could even say, hey, do you have one of those cool AI art generators? Like, generate some outfits, right? You could ask them to show you the prompt to generate that outfit of how they made sure that it had that balance that they were looking for using the terminology and that knowledge in chapter five, right? So there's all of these interesting ways that we could have students show visual balance. It's not just this sort of meh discussion board, right? You could have students make a social media post for like TikTok analyzing those three outfits, right? Students love a social media challenge. Like give a, like make me a quick video analyzing these three videos. They will get, they get so creative. I used to do video assessments in my math class. You will be blown away at some of the video editing and things that students will do for like a silly assignment. They just, they love those types of assignments. So, and then you still give them this option for the student that doesn't want to do that. And the nice thing is, is you could even just maybe at some point get rid right of the discussion board. And now we have something that they really can't do using chat GPT, right? If we lean towards these video assessments or these drawings or these bringing in stuff from your own life where you have to go take the picture, we're, we're really taking AI out of, the, out of the picture. And I know that's not easy in every single discipline, right? Um, but it's, it's being creative and being like, well, how could I? How could I do this? Is it possible? Um, the book that I recommended is up above, um, I think it was Brandon who put it in the chat. Brandon Gamer put it in the chat. Oh, sorry, my God, I forgot that I was connected to the slides for a second. We did a great job. I told you, we should all be course designers and go in and help people make their courses better, right? This is this is our new job. We're all going to do this together. Um, so by the way, this idea of giving students options for how they might show their understanding is a huge piece of universal design for learning or UDL. It's something I do in my own courses. I tell students, here's the objective. Here's what I want to measure with this. Um, and you can choose. It, it helps the students feel like the choice that they're making is relevant to them, right? They feel like they get a choice. They have some power. It's not a me versus them. I didn't decide magnanimously what this is. I, like, I'd let everybody decide, like, what do you want to do? And I'll usually give them a little bit more structure too, in terms of like, hey, if you want to do this, because you don't want, like you're scared, this is the easiest, we'll just do this one, <laughs> you'll be fine. Because uh, it's math, it's stats, they're, they're sometimes a little bit terrified. Um, and then I'll be like, hey, if you want a little more freedom, here, go here, make a suggestion. What do you think that I miss? Like, and I love this option too. I'm now realizing my my order of operations for my slides could use some work because option two is one of my favorite things to do, and that is to have students help me build my course um, to make it better for the next semester. Because one, I'm saving myself work, uh, but two, students really buy into this idea that she's going to use this next semester, right? Like they love the idea that they're giving me something that then I'm going to be able to put into the course and that they are build like this is beyond just their own learning that they're showing. Um, so we only made it through one of the two pillars so far. Thankfully, uh, the last two pillars are going to go quick. Um, the second pillar is about reducing bias. So I think we've already got this. Uh, what are some ways that we can reduce bias? Make sure that our assessments are not subjective.
I love that we're learning about everybody in the chat. This is the best day ever. Yes. Okay. Percent grades are super biased, right? Uh, in fact, actually, uh, oh my God, uh, Feldman puts those into accuracy. He basically says if we average percents, especially zeros, uh, into that, we are inherently building like this not accurate grade, right? Like we, it's what some people call objectivity theater. Uh, is this like, oh, we I added these numbers together and they magically came up as a 65. And it was like, but you chose what the numbers were and you chose how to add them together. So in reality, there were a lot of choices you made. Grading anonymously is a great way to do that. I don't ever do it, even though I can in Canvas, uh, because I like seeing my students' voice and being able to sort of respond to them directly as them. Um, nobody's going to say rubrics. You guys were doing, you were, you were crushing as an audience for so long. You're helping me so much as a, as a teacher. Uh, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> rubrics. Canvas does make rubrics not the easiest to impu input, but they're not bad. And especially if you decide to do a single point rubric. So this example here is a single point rubric for one of my discussion boards. Um, so I just, it's basically kind of what you saw for those criteria for the lady, like the display is provided because my students have to go find a display and there's a whole bunch of help on how to go find a display. And this is like of data. And so did they meet it or did they forget to put it in there? Um, did they give an accessible link? Because I make my students learn about accessibility, both in data visualization and just in general. So they have to make a descriptive text link, no URL with a whole bunch of HTTPS, but like change it and I give them the tech help on how to do that. Um, did they explain, like, so this is all just single point. Did they meet it or not? And I've given them some details on how maybe they might be missing the mark. So for me, grading this, super easy. I just click down this list and you'll see there's no points on anything. It's just met or not met. I click down the list. I don't have to provide a whole lot of individual feedback to each student. I saw in the chat earlier, like it's easy to provide feedback when the student did really well, and it's hard to provide feedback when they made a mistake. Not for me. Um, I do a lot at the beginning. It's hard because I, I do a lot of building of relationships at the beginning of my online semester. It's just, it's the worst. But after like week two, I'm clicking down this list, pressing, you got a one out of two, and then send, I have a little generic comment that's like, hey, please check the rubric for feedback. Email me if you have any questions or don't understand anything. Resubmit when you can. If it's a discussion board that it has its own little thing, it's like you can't edit your post, but you can reply with your updates. Um, and I don't let them edit because one, you get all those students who love that, like, you know, put in a space and then press enter and then go back and put in their actual post once they've seen everybody else's. Um, and also because I want to see their growth. Right when I go back and I want to see, oh, did this student? Because if I have this this rubric up, the next time I open the assignment, the rubric is already filled in, and I know the only thing the student was missing was the accessible link. So I'm not regrading the whole thing. I'm looking to see did they reply and did they make a descriptive link, and then I'm just clicking that over and giving them the two points. So my regrading is exceptionally easy because. My resubmissions, I use rubrics for everything. And so I know exactly what one or two things they need to fix. And I'm just checking those one or two things. I'm not rereading the whole post. Yeah, Cassie. Um, our survey asked what further sessions we should yes. have. And mm -hmm. I think you, Miss Kelly, who is fantastic, should teach a grading assignments using your rubric and how you do it. So I would be the first in line to attend because I would love to see you. No, I'm not kidding. You're laughing, but I'd love to see you in action. You just taught me something. I spend so much time responding to each student. Um, and you know what? Mistake. It's too time consuming. And then my feedback gets back to them longer. I, I provide these fantastic rubrics. I even explain where they need to improve in the rubric. And so for you to teach how you do it and then how to do the improvement would be so helpful. So um, I hope that that is captured because I've already submitted my survey. I hope it's <laughs> captured by uh, Marina. Marina, please get that. I will be the first one. 
<laughs> it is now recorded forever in posterity, like, you know, just there. Um, so I have great questions in the chat. Um, uh, do I use freeform comments? Yes. Yes. In fact, I have a Google sheet full of each, like for every assignment that has some freeform questions that I might like this accessible link. They have a lot of, lot of struggles. I don't know if it's just where it was in the content to here. They've just completely forgotten. Um, so I do have like a, a quick little, like, Hey, this was in two point it's in two point three. It says that. Um, but usually I'll go back or I'll use the message students who to be like, Hey, you know, so-and-so in the class, they fixed their link in their reply. I, I'd suggest looking back at Cassie's response to see, see how Cassie fixed that link so you can see what the edit looks like. So I do that type of thing in my like message students who is in my announcements. I try to call out students who've done something really well. If you're like, hey, you're still not understanding what observational units are. Like, you know who did a great job of that? Like Tracy Crush, like let's talk about Tracy's example and why that was perfect. So that's the type of thing that I'll do in my announcements and my message students too. Um, and sometimes in the submission comments, I try not to use the rubric comments uh, and mostly I do submission comments and then, um, but it's, it's rare that I use the, and some of them I have more detailed rubrics. I think I have one later. Uh, that I show where I actually put the different errors students might have so that I can kind of highlight it. Um, there's still no point. It's still no points on it, but it still works uh, that way. And yeah, I don't have any points on this. Uh, the rubric is just quick feedback. And then I put in a zero, one or two. A zero is you, you didn't give me anything. A one is there's still something that you can improve upon. And a two is this shows me your understanding of all the things that I was hoping to see in this particular assignment. Um, so that back in fashion one, we could easily go from those criteria back to a single point rubric, right? Did you post your three images? Did you use the terminology correctly? Did you justify your stuff? And the nice thing is, otherwise we're sitting and thinking about points, they're probably going, okay, well, justification is the most important part. So maybe that's like 10 points. And then the terminology, I guess that's pretty important too, but not as important as the justification. That's maybe a five. And then the three looks, I guess that's five. We'll get to, that'll get us 25. We're having to figure out the points and parsing all that out. And then you get to the point of like, well, they did an okay job of justification. How many of the 10 points did they get? And that's where you actually spend your time grading. You don't realize it, but most of your time spent grading is trying to justify the points that you've given. And if you don't do this, if you just say yes or no, you're not going to spend nearly as much time grading. I do grade a lot of things, but I grade, I spend a lot less time grading each individual thing. Allison. Yeah, so I'm just trying to uh, clarify my question about the categories on yes. the rubric. So I love, I, so I, what I'm loving is that is I think what a lot of us love is the way you created that rubric that has um, so many different little categories that really spell out for the student exactly what you're expecting. And so in mine, I have far fewer sections, like I have my main post, which lists everything you have to include for the full credit. And then I have my response posts and that same thing, it's like very generic, what I expect in your response post. So, but what I'm questioning is if I'm making my discussions worth points, so these categories each have to have points attached to them, it might take me a long time when I create the rubric to figure out how it would all work out as far as let's just say uh, student A turns in um, one that is missing um, the first three of your categories, and but they have the others. But so since every student's gonna have a slightly different variation if they aren't totally perfect, how do you work it out? So you allocate enough points for each one so that in the end, let's say it's out of 10 points, the student gets at least seven points if they've done a fairly good job. I guess I might you could just go back in. You could just go back in and give them a seven. Like you don't ha like you don't have to be tied to the dumb points in your rubric. Oh, okay. I see right? what you're saying. I see yeah. what you're saying. Like I you could, could just have it without points in the rubric and then give a student a seven if they yes. had made a good stab at it, yes. but were missing a few of the criteria. Yes. 100%. And that's okay. exactly what I do is mine is these don't have points on them and students either get one, you made a good stab at it, but I want you to resubmit or two, you, you showed me everything. 
And honestly, yeah. like, uh -huh. it's sad because students will have like just the tiniest bit wrong and they're getting a one and a student who had a whole bunch wrong is also getting a one. But to me, it's like you both could do better. <laughs> so could yeah. do better. And it's apples and oranges sometimes on what yeah. they're missing and also their own, per, their own, um, per, I should say their own, sorry, I'm being, it's, it's late Friday, right? <laughs> their, their own preparation. So a student who can do better and is an A student and, and normally has a very high academic preparation as far as they're a good writer. And then a student that's really struggling, maybe it's their first college course, they still both need to improve. So I see what you're saying. Yes, 100%. Yes, and, it, and it's so it's, it's it's super equitable to be like, hey, I'm going to give you both the support you need, right? Like, yeah, and, uh -huh. and you're completely right. Like a student who maybe doesn't understand these things, like doesn't know how to read through a rubric is going to miss the mark, but they're going to have the ability to get up there when I know they're capable of it. Yeah. Okay. And thank you. And then just connecting to another workshop I was in yesterday about the idea that we really need to provide um, substantive feedback to our students in online classes. So I took that to mean that you had to provide really substantive written comments, which I simply just would not have time to do for every single student. You know, I do it occasionally um, if something's really outstanding or somebody, I do it always when someone is missing, missing the point of the assignment. But um, we could, could this, could this detailed rubric essentially represent substantive feedback to our students? I mean, you're you're going in and giving them that feedback to let them know what they did and didn't understand, right? Which is what yeah. Cassie uh -huh. pointed out is sort of the par purpose of all of this, right? To help yeah, students yeah. understand uh -huh. what they don't get yet. So yeah, okay. okay. Yeah, way, way easier, right? Way um, easier. All right. Well, thank you. You just yes. like maybe cut my workload in half. I mean, once I make the rubrics. So, Perfect. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the rubric. So there's a lot of upfront design. And like I said, I don't just immediately jump to a rubric and like, hey, read this. Um, I do give a lot more like hand holding and like like feedback in the submission comments at the very beginning of the semester, uh, those first couple of assignments. And then I sort of step back and I'm like, hey, you now have this. I'm still here in the submission comments for a back and forth. If you don't understand what's there or you need some guidance, uh, if they take like two stabs and they're still not ma making the mark, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna like, go in and give them an, an actual nudge with some writing. But for most students, especially those A and B students, the rubric is enough and they, they're, they're off. Um, some other bias resistant ideas because we are short on time. So I'm gonna rush through these last couple slides. Um, these are from Feldman. Um, I, you'll notice in my rubric, there's nothing about the timing of the work. It's not about like a timely reply. I don't have any points related to that. Uh, this is from Feldman's work, this idea that grades should be based on the actual work and not the timing or compliance. Um, this, I mean, he always says people justify this like, well, I had to submit things on time. I'm like, I have submitted many a thing late. I think I'm late on my summer book requisition and uh, no one has done anything to me. <laughs> so <laughs> I haven't lost any points. They didn't like deduct money from my paycheck. So um, yeah, I do send them more annoying, annoying, naggy emails. I do have close dates because I do I'm going to tell on you. <laughs> uh, I do think it's important that they like manage their time and recognize what they can and can't get done. So like the first four weeks of the semester, you can't submit that stuff after week six, because I really want you to know where you are in the class. So I kind of have resubmissions up until a point. Um, but I don't, I don't, there's nothing wrong with being like, you, it's fine. Um, alternative consequences for cheating. This goes back to that idea of like, when Cassie mentioned getting that like AI generated sounding sort of discussion board, Instead of saying, oh, you cheated, here's a zero, this sounds like AI, which as Matthew, I think was who pointed out in the chat, like you're just gonna get into it with a student over whether or not it was AI, that, that's not a place I wanna be. Um, instead, just pushing back and saying, hey, could you redo this in your own voice? Or could you redo this in this way? Or, hey, I'd like to meet with you to talk about this post before I grade it. Doing something like that, it really, like when students cheat, it's because they don't wanna do the work, they're avoiding it. And by giving them a zero, you're actually letting them avoid the work, right? So let's get them to do the work, uh, pushing in some other way. Um, getting rid of participation and effort grades, um, because again, like I wanna grade their understanding, not just some like, did you check some boxes? Um, and then his last idea, which is a little bit scary in an online class, is that everything should be based entirely on summative assessments. 
Um, and what he means here is just like not homework, right? I don't know. As a math instructor, I've had students who have 100% on homework and like a 20% on exams. And a student with a 0% on homework who has 100% on exams. So like homework, it's different for different people. Uh, so let's not grade that. Um, but I also subscribe to one of his ideas that everything is formative until it is summative. That's why everything in my class is resubmit until you show me that you understand this. Because now it's summative. Now I know you understand this idea. We can both move on uh, and think about other things. Um, so that's sort of where I'm going. Uh, and yeah, so Diane, that's completely right. This last bullet to me is the complete, incomplete, the resubmissions. I, I get this last bullet and all the other bullets for free, like by just doing resubmissions and sort of saying, uh, and I'm telling like, my student feedback, my online classes, they're like, this is the first time I feel like my, my teacher's actually here to help me learn because we're going back and forth in the submission comments and I'm trying my hardest to get them to that um, work. Um, yeah, so there's some formative work that I don't, I is in the grade book that I don't actually look at. So this kind of comes back to the frequency and variety questions that are uh, in the Q&A that I never got to. Um, which is like, I have my students have a bunch of different things they can do to learn. They go into the grade book. So if someone comes to my office hours and they're like, I didn't do so well, I don't understand. I'm like, well, you didn't look at the content before. Like I, I, I beautifully made this module in a progression for a reason, um, but I don't, if they don't do that, that's on them, right? That's a choice. And some students come into my class with a lot of already knowledge on stats or calculus or pre-calculus, whatever it is. and if they don't need to watch my videos about pre-calculus, that's fine. If they understand pre-calculus, let's, let's both move on, right? Um, I could probably push them a little further and get them to do a little bit more, but that's um, what I mean. Yeah, so the, between formative and summative is formative is like uh, assessments that help you learn. And then summative is the like final assessment that shows what you've learned. To me, they're one and the same. I don't like, they should all be just the same. Um, but we tend to think of them as different, like classwork and homework are formative, whereas like your exam is summative, because that's at the end of all the classwork. All this preparation was for this one moment, this one high stakes exam that was terrifying. Um, lastly, and the most important idea, so good thing I saved it for last, uh, motivational. How do we use grades to motivate students? Because uh, in general, putting points on things is not motivational. Uh, we There's a bunch of research that actually shows once you give a student a grade, like I said, uh, they are less likely to look at your feedback. They're not even going to bother. They saw the grade. They, you've, you've told them what it was worth, uh, and they're not going to learn from it. So this is my old class. This is how I used to do this. Uh, I had this beautiful, oops, uh, this rubric that had like for every question on a worksheet, it would say like all the different errors they could make, like either full marks and then like every mistake I've seen. And I would add more as they came in. Uh, and then I give them little written comments. These were the ones that were saved in my Google uh, sheet and I'd bring them over. And I, what happened is this is the final grades in that class. Most of these students never resubmitted. They were happy with their 12.5, their 14, their 16.5, they just stopped, didn't get to 20. Almost every, like, I mean, I probably had like three resubmissions. It was great. There wasn't a whole lot to grade, but they weren't taking advantage of all this time I spent writing, like copy and pasting in this comment. Um, and so I decided I'm going to do something different. We had tried complete incomplete in one of our cohorts and I didn't like it. Um, you couldn't use the module requirements to let students have little check marks because I like the little check marks and the module requirements if you use those in Canvas. Uh, I can, when I'm using point grades, I can tell it. A student needs a two out of two in order to get the check mark and like know that they've passed that like thing and don't need to still work on it. Um, but if you use complete and complete, you can't use that. Um, and you can't manually enter grades by like giving everybody a one or whatever. So I didn't love it. And there's only two levels. I wanted a level to show progress. I really wanted to like be like, you're on the way. You've done something, just keep going. Um, so what I did is I ended up hacking my Canvas grade book um, so all of my grades would show up as letter grades. It still shows a number if they like look at it, but um, this is just a letter grade in Canvas, but that letter grade has, has been reworked. So instead of um, like 100% you see here is success instead of saying an A, right? Less than 51 is just an almost, and then zero is a not yet. So the students are seeing more qualitative feedback as opposed to a number. 
uh, right. Ooh, I could definitely do that for you, Jennifer. I could do that. We have a bunch of like our um, cohorts that we've done because uh, every cohort that we've done with our, um, our learning team has used these similar grading schemes. We always make them very silly in terms of like, one was like a fire theme. I don't know. We, we have different themes, but we've used this a lot. Um, but anyways, I like this because it allowed me to have those three levels. Um, you could go to more levels if you wanted. Like if you really wanted to have like, hey, you did an exceptional job, um, but it moves away from the like zero to 100 grading scheme. So it was just everything's on three levels. It's not there yet. You're almost there or it's great. Um, so I love Zaretta Hammond's work. Um, I do think that giving students the opportunity to try something and know that there's no penalty, right? This isn't their final submission, that they're going to be able to resubmit, that they're going to get feedback, just allows students to be a little bit more curious, right? They're able to kind of, oh, I'm going to try, like, let's see if this works. I might go, instead of like playing it safe, right? Um, and so I, 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 I do love having this sort of different grading scheme that I use. Um, and then the, the last thing I, I have to mention, um, I, I'm just throwing things at the wall now because we're at five minutes to go, but it's the last thing is um, this idea of renewable assignments. We talked about authentic assignments, right? These assignments that like students get to really use, they get to bring in their interests, like take a picture of your outfits, or we talked about that, right? Like, or maybe just find a fashion collection that represents your culture or is interesting to you as opposed to just find a current fashion, right? Like make it authentic. Um, but no matter what, Almost every assignment we give in our classes adds nothing to the world, right? A student takes their time to do it. We take the time to grade it, and then it gets thrown away. Or it, like, lives in Canvas until, it, like, Canvas, like, expires it or whatever happens, right? Like, it's just, it's gone. So what David Wiley suggests, and I've, I've seen, and I think Susan McKeem talked about this forever ago, which is why I got into it, is this idea of a renewable assignment. So having students create things for your classroom that go beyond their own learning. So if they, if you can do like a community-based learning project, right? Or, hey, write a letter to somebody like, you know, to a congressperson, or to, like somewhere it feels like there might actually be something that happened. Um, that's where it's at. And so this is actually what I do with my class. And that you saw that the option number two, um, where I have my students create a lot for my future classes, right? I'm having them build things. And especially with something like math, where I don't have so many opportunities to like, show how sine curves are relevant to you in real life. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm instead forced to be like, hey, I get it. It's math. But like, why don't you make a video explaining in your own words for the next student how to do one of the problems in the OpenStax textbook? And I can put it up in a playlist. And that way, students have a repository, right? Like, and then I can nudge them. I can kind of do that comment thing that, that Matthew said of like, hey, I'm not sure if I were a student, I would understand this step you took between here and here. Could you like expand upon that for me? Um, because you'll get students that just sort of try to walk through answers that they don't really understand. Um, but I, I, the renewable assignments really get the buy-in from students and also uh, allow me to go in fun ways with my assignment choices. Uh, which I think is a huge part of, of making online course interesting for me to grade. Uh, and here still, by the way, even if I'm doing a video, single point rubric, you explained this well, da, 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 like just right, right down the line. Um, and you watch them at one and a half speed. And at some point you get good enough to maybe even just scan through a couple of them to make it a little bit better. Um, but yeah, we talked about everything in the CVC rubric, a lot of it. Uh, we didn't get to the frequency. Like I said, I do a ton. Uh, variety, I do think you need to go beyond the discussion board. I use a quiz every week, uh, which is auto-graded. That's the sort of low-level bloom stuff that they can take in limited times. I do a activity every week that could be an assignment. It might be an outside thing. And I do a discussion board every week. So, uh, and, and then I have those portfolios, which was the thing that had all those different possible ideas. So I do try to go just beyond uh, the traditional discussion board in terms of what I have them working with. Um, I'm going to press the next thing. We talked about everything except for self-assessment. I will mention, I love, I have a uh, discussion board where every student is in their own group, like just them. 
and they do their reflections. So at like three points during the semester, they reflect on their learning and their strategies in the class um, and sort of do their own self-assessment within a discussion board so they can see their prior post uh, and I can respond back in the discussion board. Uh, so that's how I do a little bit of the self-assessment uh, in my class. Um, but that's, that's it. And then Cassie, you can ask your question in our last minute. Will you provide the slides for us? Yes, yes. The at one is always really great in making me get those slides. And then I will add all those resources, I promised, to the um, final slide. I'm sorry. And where will they go? Uh, they go on there. They have a lovely page. I don't. Um, I actually sure posted the link in Thank chat. You. <laughs> you can scroll up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lovely okay. page. You can, you can go watch my old webinar if you want to go learn about math. Okay, so I, I'm sorry, Ray, uh, Ray which, which one? Uh, it's that Brandon? one that I just posted and is the second of the two things Brandon posted, the Spring 24 webinars. Okay, all right. And, that's and I one. highly recommend Suzanne Joaquin's one on authentic assessment in STEM. Even if you're non-STEM, it's totally relevant to everyone. I don't know why it was labeled that way, besides all of her examples are STEM. Kelly, I'm sorry to be a pain in the neck. Can you tell me specifically where I go in um, here, the, uh, the, the web page? Where do I go to find you and find this information? So if you're on this site here, I got it, Brandon. I got you. Um, Thank you. You can, you can just do like a, a control F or whatever, a command F if you're a Mac person. But you can just scroll down. There's a lot of great like if you were into the equitable grading practices, like no, no, but I mean you. I want I'm your here. slide. You just scroll, scroll. There's an old one by me. I'm way down at the bottom because they're in order of chronological order. Right, so right. Uh, we are still going assessing. It'll be here when okay. I. It takes them like two, three weeks, Brandon. I'm actually about to dress that in my closing. Oh, sorry, I'm Brandon. Sorry. Let, let's okay. let Brandon go. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Thank you so much, Kelly. It was great. Thank you, Cassie. All right, everyone. So we're at 4.30 or 4.31. I just want to be respectful of people's time. So we really appreciate you all showing up on a Friday, especially on a beautiful day where many of us are, and giving Kelly your attention. Once again, please look at the chat. You might have to scroll up a little bit past all the thank yous to complete the survey link for this webinar. As Marina mentioned at the start of this webinar, we don't provide a certificate like for our facilitated classes, but for many colleges, it seems like the completion of the survey, as long as you've checked off the option to mail yourself a response to that should suffice. In the event that it does not, please email support at cbc.edu and we will be in contact with you and get you squared away there. And we also hope that while we're finished most of our spring webinars, we do hope that you register for some of the excellent ones that we have coming up. As I noted earlier, please, please, please make sure to fill out that survey. Uh, for those that don't know, I came in just a little bit later, but I'm actually the Acting Director of Professional Development for CBC at one and work alongside Marina. So me and my team really do pour through all of that survey data and see where there's a demand for and develop webinars based on that moving forward. So if there's a speaker that you like in particular or a subject, well, I can't promise that we can do every single one of them. We can definitely make sure that if we see an ongoing demand for RSI or authentic assessment, it's pretty easy for us to put on another one or maybe even call someone back for a repeat session if they want to elaborate on that one. And I will put the it's support at cbc. Okay. I was like, I was like, which one am I looking for? Yeah, it'll oh, I think I just messaged that to someone who did support at cbc.edu. Okay. So be sure to capture it because it will probably scroll off in like five seconds. <laughs> anyway, so as Kelly alluded to. The webinar and associated slides will be posted on that same webinar website. Please do allow us a little bit of time. It does take us time to get it captioned because it is roughly an hour and a half worth of content. And we do want to make sure that everything is completely accessible. But we've been getting them up usually within a week of the webinar being completed. We had a little bit of a slow start, but once we got everything squared away, they've been doing it pretty quickly. That's, All say, right, that's, folks. that's faster than before. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to go on and stop the recording now. And once again, thank you all for giving us so much of your time on this evening. Take care and have a great rest of your day. Thank you all. Have a good Friday. Thank you so much, Kelly. It was really spectacular. Really loved it.